good morning. You know, I have to say when they asked me, a church planner who planted a church in the middle of COVID in Phoenix, Arizona to speak at the 2022 Southern Baptist Convention Pastors Conference, I thought what any other church planner would have thought, what a fundraising opportunity. <laughs> so after the sermon, we're gonna be passing around some giving envelopes. I'm, I'm just kidding, it is an honor to be here with you, to be asked to preach here. And though I know it's cliche to say, I do feel like we find ourselves in interesting times. I know the Bible tells us not to think of the current times as harder than the former times, but it is an interesting time we find ourselves. Society and culture has seemed to make truth subjective while elevating emotions to be the only objective in our culture where emotions run supreme and truth is, well, whatever you make it. Which makes the word of God, the truth that we have in our hands, even more important. We know that Jesus told us that the truth will set us free. So as we go through the book of Colossians, we know that Paul is building up to some really big points. But here in the opening of his letter, he's gonna rest on some truths before he can make some of those points. This is a textbook, Paul Move. Yesterday we heard, having showing, showed us the universal significance of Christ, Paul now takes the truth and drops it in the laps of the people of the Church of Colossae. He brings it to the individual level, and this is where he's going. I get the privilege of preaching through Colossians 1, 21 through 23, and in verse 23, this is what he's building up to. In verse 23, it says, if indeed you remain grounded and steadfast in the faith and are not shifted away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard. Isn't that what we want? Isn't that what we want for our people and our churches to be grounded and steadfast even in the midst of change in our culture? Isn't that what we want for our people and our churches to not shift from the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ that they have heard? Isn't that what we want for us as pastors? To be grounded and steadfast, to not shift from our hope. Well, that's what Paul wants for the church of Colossae. But to get there, to get to grounded and steadfast, Paul needs to get us through some truths. So Paul's gonna emphasize two major truths that we're gonna look at, and then he's gonna exhort the church to remain grounded and steadfast. But the reason Paul has to emphasize some truths before he can make this point is because it's only on a truth that you, will build, that you can build a solid foundation that you can remain grounded in. It's only in a truth that you can remain steadfast amid the variety of trials that you will face. And it's only in truth that you will place your hope in the finished work of the cross. So Paul has two truths for us before he gets there. Here's the first one. Through him, those who are far can be brought close. He says in verse 21, once you were alienated and hostile in your minds as expressed in your evil actions. On his way to helping the church in Colossae be grounded and steadfast, he starts with their previous condition before the Lord. If we break down verse 21, it says they were alienated, hostile in mind, and they had evil deeds. To be alienated means to be far from God, to be separated from him. To be hostile in mind looks like being selfish in mind, self-seeking, void of pursuing the will of God. And their evil actions are the evidence that they were both alienated and hostile in mind. And this is true of all of us at one point in our lives. We are naturally born with a sinful condition that causes us to be alienated from God, hostile in our mind, which always results in evil actions. But if we're honest, this side of kingdom come, we all are gonna continue to struggle with this. There's a real way that functionally we can alienate ourselves from God. There's a way that we can make our ministries or our church attendance or whatever it is that we're called to do, we can make that more about duty than devotion. 
And when we do that, it just kind of functionally alienates us from God. And when we alienate ourselves from God, then our ministries become far less about your kingdom come, your will be done, and becomes about my kingdom now. Because alienation from God will always result in self-centeredness and pride. And with it, without a doubt, when we alienate ourselves from God and from his word, when we start to develop a hostility of mind, it will always end with evil, non-honoring, sinful actions. But what's true for the non-believer that we preach every week is still true for us today. That through him, those who are far from him can be brought close. We see that through the cross that we are moved from estrangement and alienation into intimate fellowship with God. That no matter how far you have wandered, you are only ever one step away from the loving embrace of your heavenly father. So Paul, on his way to building towards, remain grounded and steadfast. He says, look back to where you were. You were once alienated, hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. And then he gives us this second point, that through him, through Christ, those who are guilty are redeemed. Verse 22 says, but now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him. We break this down. It says, by his physical body through his death. death. The place where we are reminded of the truth and the hope that we so desperately need is also the place where it costs Jesus Christ his literal life. We are made holy, faultless, and blameless before God only because of the blood, life, and death of Jesus Christ. It's nothing we did. It's only in the death of Christ that we are made holy, faultless, and blameless. But my favorite part of this verse is it says, he died to present us holy, blameless, and faultless. To present means to display that that will be our identity. And as I was preparing for this, I was thinking about a personal story in my life. My wife and I struggled with infertility for many years. We ended up being able to adopt two little girls. And our, our eldest daughter, when she was born, her birth mother gave her the name Madeline. But through the course of adoption and the adoption process, and then one day a judge smacks the gavel and says, from now and furthermore, this child shall be known as Briella. That through this act of adoption, her identity and her name have changed. That she will no longer ever be remembered as Madeline. That's not who she is. That may be how she was born, but that's not her name. And what's, it's true for us, too, that though we were originally alienated from God, hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, Jesus Christ in his death presents us that we shall now and forevermore be known as holy, blameless, and faultless before him. What a wonderful truth that our names and identities have been changed. The best implication from this is that through the cross, we stand before God as though we've never turned away. Growing up, my I had some huge aspirations. I knew that I wanted to serve in the military, but my, my goals far succeeded that when I said that I wanted to become a doctor. I said I was gonna become a doctor or a physician's assistant or somehow be in the medical field at a high level. And my dad would always tell me, he would say, Mr. Mueller, don't forget from whence you came. I grew up in this rural town in eastern Colorado. And he said, don't forget where you came from. Don't set your goals so high that you forget where you were. Unfortunately, we sometimes find ourselves wanting to live in a verse 22 world where we are wholly blameless and faultless without a verse 21 reality, which means we are still prone to alienation, hostility of mind, and evil actions. We love to be reminded of our holiness and faultlessness before God. And while that's good and right, we also need to remind ourselves that we didn't do anything to earn that. 
And we are still so prone to alienating ourselves from God, to being selfish and hostile in our minds, and unfortunately that comes out in evil actions. And it's those hostility of mind, those evil actions and our alienation that cost Jesus his life. Don't get me wrong, to be overly occupied with your sin is not healthy in your spiritual walk. But to forget who you are and who you were is to take a path in your spiritual walk that only leads to spiritual pride and further alienates us from the source of our hope and the source of our truth. But when you combine verse 21 with verse 22, that is a powerful place to live. Because people who can live with the combination of verse 21 and 22 will say things like this, I was super broken, but now I am faultless before God. They will say things like, I was lost in my sin, but now I am redeemed. They will say things like, I was guilty, but now I am forgiven. I am broken, estranged, and alone, but now I am his. What a powerful place to live. What security. In a world where it seems like everything's changing, that is the safest place you can be is with your identity resting in the finished work of the cross. So Paul gives us those two truths. And then he leads to this, that through him, through Christ and in him, those who are redeemed respond. Paul says in verse 23, if indeed you remain grounded and steadfast in the faith and are not shifted away from the hope of the gospel that you heard. The glorious truth of verse 21 and 22 that we were once far and now brought close, the truth that we were once guilty, now redeemed, demands a response. It demands that we are changed and we live differently from that. To be grounded and steadfast in our faith means to not shift from the hope of the gospel. If you think about it, a, a shifty hope pushes us away from the source of our hope and just creates more distance between us and God, which is alienation. It's only when we can be, grab a hold and stay firm in the hope that we have in God that we stay close to him, which is the source of our hope. Paul calls the church to have a grounded faith, to have a rooted faith in the, in the finished work of the cross. You know, there's that popular Christian song right now that called Gyra, and there's a line in that that resonates with me that says, I was never holding you up so I could never let you down. What's interesting about that as I think about it is it's true that where we place our hope, we are asking to hold us up to sustain us when we encounter trials of various kinds. We're asking that hope to not let us down. But when we place in our hope in something other than the finished work of cross, we are building a foundation that will eventually crumble and let us down. We become grounded and steadfast when we remind ourselves of the stabilizing power of our unchanging condition before God, that no matter what we do, no matter what we go through, we will continue to be seen as holy, blameless, and faultless before him. We become grounded and steadfast when we rest there. We remind ourselves of that daily. But if we're honest, while grounded and steadfast sounds great, it's not always easy. If you think about it, it's only through times of drought that trees push their roots deeper to find water. It's only through times of trial that steadfastness is produced. I'm reminded of James chapter one that says, count it all joy when you encounter trials of various kinds and let steadfastness have its full effect because in steadfastness you are made perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But without the trial, that steadfastness isn't produced. And when we encounter trials of various kinds, we can count on two things. First, we will be tempted to shift our hope. We will be tempted to put our hope in something else because it's not always gonna feel safe. But the second thing that we can count on is that God will continue to be at work. I remember in 
2011, I had just finished boot camp in the Army, and I had just graduated combat medic school, and I was really starting to, to grow in my faith, and a friend of mine had sent me a book called Crazy Love by Francis Chan, and I had never really read Christian books, and so I ate it up. And there was a part in that book where Francis Chan says, do we really trust God, and are we really living for him? An example he gave was, we will often pray for safe travels. Now, don't get me wrong, this isn't my sermon where I tell you we shouldn't pray for safe travels. I'm glad you got here safely, and I pray you get home safely. But will our hearts allow us to pray things like, God, if you need me to be inconvenienced on my travel so that I can share the gospel with somebody else, or you need me to be inconvenienced for your glory, Lord, your will be done, not mine. Will our hearts allow us to pray things like that? Well, maybe it's because I just came out of boot camp and was ingrained with these values of honor, character, selfless service, and sacrifice. But after reading that, I, I prayed before God and I said, God, if you need me to go through something awful, you need me to go through something difficult, for your glory, I'm a willing sacrifice, your will be done, not mine. At the time, I was single, a brand new soldier, and I thought, yeah, I'd be happy to sacrifice for the glory of God. But sometime after, I started to put my identity in the uniform I wore. I found my identity in the, the U.S. Army printed on my chest and the rank that I wore. My identity became all about how good I was as a combat medic, and the Lord had made me good at it. But it became my identity, and then something crazy happened. I'm half blind, and if you didn't recognize that, maybe you're half blind. <laughs> but that happened because in January 2014, I was taking my 85 Dodge pickup truck that my father-in-law had restored and given to me. I was taking it to my hometown in Fort Morgan, Colorado to leave with my brother as I was preparing for my second deployment. I was going to leave it with him to take care of. And on the way, I encountered some black ice. I lost control of the truck and I rolled. In the process, I broke my neck and all the bones on the right side of my face. In that moment, everything changed. I ended up being in a coma for five days and on that first night, they would tell my wife, Tracy, hey, Matthew's probably not gonna make it through the night. Then after God proved them wrong and brought me through the night, they said, hey, Tracy, just so you know, Matthew may never walk again. And God proved him wrong. And in that moment, like I said, everything changed. I had had my hope and my identity in the uniform I wore. And as I recovered and came out of that, I fought to stay in the military. And they looked at me and said, listen, we don't have a need for a one-eyed combat medic. So the thing I placed my hope in crumbled. And it was in that moment that I was forced to turn back and repent, that I had put my identity in something other than the finished work of the cross, and Tracy and I hit our knees and we prayed, God, we don't know what's next, but we trust you with it. And about the time I was retiring, we had reached the peak of our battle with infertility. We had had a couple miscarriages. And my wife Tracy came to me and she said, babe, if we're not able to have kids of our own, I want to move to Phoenix, where my sister is with my six nieces and nephews, and I want to watch them grow up. If we can't have kids of our own, I want to be around my family. And it's funny how our plans changed, because I swore up and down I would live, die, and retire in this beautiful state of Colorado, and the Lord brought me to the desert of Phoenix. But I said when you encounter trials, you encounter on two things. One, that your hope will shift, unfortunately. I had put my hope in the uniform and it let me down. But the other thing I promised you is that in trials, God will continue to be at work. See, God used that accident. In the middle of me being in a coma, Tracy is lifting up prayers on Facebook and people are watching her faith come alive and they're messaging her saying, Tracy, I, I don't know how you can believe in the middle of all this, but it's giving me faith. People came to the Lord because of what I went through and my wife's response to it. Yeah, 
But even more than that, can I tell you, God allowed that accident to happen to me, to move me to Phoenix, because in Phoenix, I became a part of a church called Valley Life Church, the first church I was ever a member of. It was there that I was discipled. It was there that I was baptized. It was there that I was trained and, and grew into be a pastor, and then it was there that I was called to plant a church. Now, I didn't know that that church would be called to be planted in the middle of COVID, but can I tell you, through this church, I've seen people go from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. I've seen people who are dead in their sins come alive because that church exists. When I tell you that God is at work in the middle of the trials, I mean it, God is at work. He wasn't caught off guard by my accident. He wasn't caught off guard by my situation, but he was just preparing me to be grounded and steadfast in him so that I could plant a church in the middle of COVID where people can hear the truth of gospel in a city that desperately needs it. God will continue to be at work until kingdom come. So Paul tells us don't shift from the hope that we have in the gospel. Remain grounded and steadfast. And rather than being shifty in our faith, Paul calls us to this. He says, don't shift from your hope in the gospel. This gospel has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and I, Paul, have become a servant of it. I think it's wonderful that Paul says he's a servant of the gospel. To be a servant of the gospel means to, to serve it, to live for it and live from it. To live for the gospel means that the gospel should influence our everyday lives. It should shape why and what we do as church leaders, church members, and church pastors. The gospel is, should be center of everything that we are doing. But we're also called to live from it. We know that those who are believers live from their identity, not for their identity. Paul David Tripp makes a point to say that we shouldn't think too big of ourselves and lean over into pride, but he also says we shouldn't think too little of ourselves where we discount what God has done for us, that we're not supposed to be too big or too small. We just need to be exactly how God made us, which is a broken person redeemed by a loving God. That's a healthy place to be if we're gonna be a servant of the gospel. In other translations, it's, that word servant of the gospel is translated minister. And maybe it's the, the combat medic in me, but I like that version because that's where we get the word administer. Like administering a medication. Those of us who were once alienated, hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, who have been reconciled by the, the death and life of Jesus Christ are now called to be administers of the gospel, administers of the good news of Jesus Christ. But if you think about it, when you do get medicine for an infection or something like that, you don't give credit to the medical assistant, nurse, doctor, or medic who gives you the medicine. The medicine is what gets all the credit. We are not the ones who get the credit for the work that's being done, but the gospel that we are administering gets all the credit. And if you think about it, this gospel has the power not only to heal like modern medicine, but also has the power to bring life to dead things. Somebody once said, how much do you have to hate someone to not share the gospel with them? We have the cure for the malignancy of people's souls. We are called to administer it, to give it away, to be a servant of the gospel. So I would say this, if we're going to be servants of the gospel, if we're gonna administer this good news, like a good flight attendant, I will tell you, first, give it to yourself. Fill yourself with the gospel. Remind yourself daily of the truth that we have in Jesus Christ. Fill yourself with the hope that it won't always be like this, that the hard days are not always gonna be like this, and in fact, if we are a Christian, if we have been redeemed by the blood of Christ, this is the closest to hell we will ever get. Fill ourselves with that hope. Fill ourselves with the joy of knowing that no matter what we go through, we will always be a child of God, redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Fill yourself with that. 
Remind yourself of the truth of where you were and where you are now, and then administer that truth to the world. Steadfast and grounded. Knowing, like Jesus said in Matthew 28, 20, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So I wonder, if Paul were in our current culture and society, I wonder what he would say to us. I think it would be something like this. You who were once alienated and hostile in minds as expressed in your evil actions, he is now reconciled by his physical body and through his death to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him if indeed you remain grounded and steadfast in the faith and are not shifted away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard. Paul would say, continue, steadfast, grounded, because you were once far and guilty, but now you have been brought close and you are redeemed. Paul would call us to remember, respond, and remain steadfast and grounded in him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that we got to gather together today to hear the preaching of your word by many great men. But God, I pray more than anything, you would remind us of the truth of who we are in you, that we would remain grounded and steadfast in the hope of the finished work of the cross. God, I know that there are people in this room who are burdened by heavy weights right now, but God, remind them that you are at work in the middle of the trials, that you don't waste an opportunity to get your glory, and God, we just need to remain grounded and steadfast in you, and you'll do the rest of the work. We pray this all in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Thank you.